So today we are going to bring these kind of topics of river permitting and management together and talk about how we can think about development in a river corridor, which we know is dynamic and change. And so we're gonna think about how we can do that in a way that's compatible with, 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 with river corridors. For me. There we go. All right, so we love our rivers, um, but there might be some love-hate relationship going on there because we um, would love to build right next to them so we can get these nice views. However, let me get out of the way. Um, however, that can be problematic when rivers move. And so they can move and expand and widen and take our homes out with our nice riverfront views. And that can make us sad or mad. So just like a family, we have to learn how we can live together. Let me just hide this. Here is Grand Junction. There's a lot going on here. We've got our river, the two rivers coming in, the Gunnison and the Colorado. We've got side channels. We've got this Las Colonias Park, the little butterfly pond, not that little side channels. Um, that humpback chub and pike, we're not humpback chub, but pike minnow and um, ponytail chub and these others endangered fish like to inhabit. And we've got development happening here, right? Redevelopment. This is uh, Dos Rios happening here that we're learning about. This is a, a, a Riverside community. So um, there's, there's a lot happening in the river corridor, this dynamic corridor. Some other things that we can look at. A really important bridge connecting to Orchard Mesa and the highway down to Delta, endangered fish habitat, water park. This is a certified levee that was built and protects the development here. Um, constructed habitat, this is habitat that connects during flood events for fish to go into. Uh, we have an armored bank over here. This is a funny area where the Bureau of Reclamation has habitat, cottonwood galleries and wetlands that they've built to offset or mitigate um, impacts elsewhere that their projects might have. And while rivers are road banks, they create Cottonwood, they create point, bar, point bars and cottonwood galleries behind them. But here, the Bureau of Reclamation is armoring this bank with riprap because they don't want it to take out, they don't want the river to take out their cottonwood trees, even though the river naturally creates cottonwood trees on the other side. So it's funny, it's complicated. Um, redevelopment here and then our flood turn community. So we, uh, when I gave my first lecture, we talked about the river corridor. It's not just the channel, it's all these things around the channel, the meander belt width, the kind of zone that the river migrates through, side channels, oxbow lakes, and then even where the river bumps up against and interacts with the hill slope, that valley margin. And we talked about how dynamic rivers can be. <clears throat> it's the Gunnison near Delta, and it's migrating. Now, I'll show you a picture of the Colorado River as well, um, but it's moving over time. And moving rivers create and support functioning ecosystems. Did you, did, on the river trip, did you guys look at kind of ecosystem things, uh, the river and um, the banks and what's growing on the banks? Or did you guys talk about anything like that? Uh, you looked at it? What'd you observe? Uh huh. Yeah, and are there more plants closer to the river? Yeah. Different kinds of plants? Yeah. We the also river. saw some cool wildlife. Ooh, what'd you, you guys see? You saw a sea otter? I was so with you. I was like, yeah, we did. <laughs> did you see the otters? Yeah. Oh, we love the otters. We saw eagles. Yeah. All those animals. I saw a statistic last night at um, a seminar that the riparian zone, this zone of green vegetation around rivers um, across the country maybe is like 1% of the land, but 80% of wildlife depends on it in some, at some point in their life. And in the desert, that's probably a lot more because that's really where all the action's happening. That's where the water is, that's where animals can live, that's where they have trees to have habitat and food. So <laughs> moving, but because rivers are able to move, they're able to create new habitat. And that's, these are little cottonwood seedlings that are growing out of a sandbar that was deposited after the 2011 flood. This is 
um, in Deer Lodge where the Yampa River goes right into the canyon there. So this is how cottonwoods are reestablished. All right, so we know that the river is dynamic, that can lead to hazards and hazards become a problem when people are kind of in the way, right? Or in the footprints. And so when, when hazards overlap with people, with infrastructure, with homes, et cetera. So rivers move. And if we put a bike path next, right up next to a river, it could move into that bike path. So here's a picture of a bike path that got washed out from the 2013 flood over on the front range. So we're gonna talk about how we can manage river quarters in a way that accounts for flood safety, um, protecting the assets. If we build important expensive things like the millions of dollars that went into Las Colonias and Dos Rios, we wanna make sure we're doing that in a way that's gonna be protected over the long term. Um, we need to think about opportunities for giving the river room, room for the river. That's a, a phrase that we use in the river management community. Where can we have opportunities for the river to move and, and have its own space? Um, and then that ultimately can lead to functioning ecosystems that work and are maintained in this urban area. So that's gonna be the bulk of the lecture today. So first, um, why plan for change? Why is that important? We'll, we'll talk about uh, tools that we can use to plan for change. So how we can map these hazards and, and know about them ahead of time. And then look at some examples of planning for change. What does that actually look like when we, when we kind of put it down and, and think about the development and, and getting ahead of this? Here's just an image of Sand Creek, which comes into the South Platte River in Denver. So it comes in from the east into Denver. And um, here's a bank line that washed out by 100 something feet in that area. So um, did they plan for that change or not? I don't know, but change happens. So why plan for change? Well, we know that the river moves in our town. Let's just zoom in. So this is, um, uh, here we go, the Broadway Bridge. It comes over to the monument, the Redlands. Here's Connected Lakes. Bananas Fun Park came up last night in this river lecture. So uh, there's a side channel right here. I think Bananas is right there. Anyone been to Bananas? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right behind it, this is like a really important side channel for endangered fish habitats. So Pike Meadow love this um, area. So anyway, we've got uh, this area right here, which is a little bit upstream of that, right across from this gravel pond where the river migrated. So here's the bike path. It's right there on the bank. And from the 20, from 2018 to 2019, we had a big runoff here in 2019. And the river took out some bank, just a little bit, maybe 50 feet, but enough to take the bike path out. Um, so, you know, that happens. The city allowed, you know, there's the zoning allowed a, a new development to come in right up to the next to the bank. This is a storage facility, like a you know, rental storage area. Um, and so because of that land use decisioning, we're basically going to have to always be maintaining this bank. Even though the river wants to move that way, that's a battle that the city chose to, to pick over the long term. And so this happened in 2019, they went back and rebuilt it. When is it gonna happen again? Could be the next five years, next 10 years. Um, the city thinks that they built it up back really stoutly. So perhaps it might be longer, we'll see. But historically the river has migrated. This is its path from 1937 to 86. And then the image is from 2022. So it basically migrated up to the South Redlands Parkway. This is 24 Road, South Redlands Parkway. And, um, and it's gonna stop there because this is where, again, we're picking another battle because we don't want it to road into that river, into that important road there that connects to the Redlands. So we want urban streams to not move. We typically do that by putting riprap on them. And this is just my analogy of that. If this is our urban stream or river, this is our public works department that's gonna come in and rip wrap and, and make sure that things aren't gonna move because we don't want it to move. And we're just, we're tired. This, this thing just keeps moving. So, um, but inevitably they, they will win because rivers are always there and they never tire. And so um, it could be a tantrum or a flood or it could just be the constant, you know, questions and needs and, um, 
you know, that a, that a toddler might have or a five-year-old might have, and they, they'll just never wear you out. So they're just always picking away, right? Um, love my son, he's great. <laughs> so if we, so what, what I'm, when I think about river management, I'm thinking about opportunities to find balance. We're always gonna have areas where we need to harden things up and we can't, we can't uh, accept or tolerate change because we have important infrastructure, et cetera. Um, but where can we also have opportunities for freedom and space? So here's our, our kids roaming out on the woods and sometimes they need to go to school. I don't like this word, but I can think of another one. Um, school is more than control, right? But, you know, <laughs> river education, I don't know. So um, sometimes I have to go to school and there's going to be some, some boundaries of, of what's acceptable. And in this case, that might be a canal and we don't, do this too much anymore, but there's a historic legacy of us putting streams and rivers and just saying, okay, we're just going to put it, this is your space now, we're going to constrain you and just going to really focus all the flood water in this area and then build right up next to some levee there. That hasn't played out well for us because when we do that, we concentrate a lot of energy in this channel and then um, inevitably that energy is gonna be released somewhere downstream. So at some point there needs to be a release. Otherwise there's gonna be a lot of destruction and it could take bridges out and homes and stuff downstream. So we're gonna think about now what does balanced management look like in Grand Junction? And we'll go through this, this flow charts. This is a decision tool for managing um, corridors and infrastructure. And it's something I got to work on when I worked for the Bureau of Reclamation before we got to teach. And we've got kind of four major steps here. We'll just go through the first three. But the first step is to think about big picture. Do we have a master plan in place? Do we have a plan that accounts for river processes? To think about how our development, where is it going to go? Where are we going to focus um, growth and development? And where we want to maybe focus other, other things for the river? So first, do you have a plan? And then we'll talk about uh, from that plan, we could have uh, evaluate hazards, think about alternatives for a particular project. And within those alternatives, this gets at that uh, wetlands reading that you have, uh, section 404 of the Clean Water Act, is when you do the developments in a sensitive area, let's think about um, um, avoiding impacts, minimizing impacts, or mitigating impacts where we can't, um, where we're going to have some. So we'll go through those, those levels right now. So the first thing is to make a plan, uh, a stream corridor master plan, you could call it that. This is a, a planning, land use planning term. And what it does is, is it's a process that thinks about, all right, what's out there? What have we done? Where have we come from in terms of our development? What are our goals? Um, the city of Grand Junction is at putting a lot of new resources and effort into um, developments on the river. And so, you know, that's one of their kind of goals and visions of kind of reconnecting, re-engaging with the river. Um, we can think about then what we want to build. So capital improvement plan refers to infrastructure. Where are the water pipes going to go? The gas pipes? Um, where are the sidewalks going to go? Where are the apartments going to go? That sort of thing. So we have a plan for that. We can think about um, both green and gray infrastructure. And so we'll, we'll take a second amongst ourselves to talk about that. But uh, the idea of infrastructure is gray. We think about concrete. We can build levees and bridges and sidewalks and stormwater ponds. And green is, is allowing the environment and, and supporting the environment to do um, services for us, be it collect stormwater, infiltrate stormwater, be it um, serve as a wetland to attenuate floods as floods move through a river corridor. Um, we can work with the environment for kind of our needs. Also part of this plan, we can have open space. So where do we want to have parks and, and, and uh, open space areas? How does transportation fit in here? And then ultimately, how do our communities connect? How um, does Clifton connect with the river? How does Palisade connect with the river? Grand Junction, Riverside Community, um, Fruta, et cetera. So all these things impact the people and we want to make sure the people have a voice into how they interact with the river. So I, I gave you some 
ideas of green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And I'm gonna zoom back, I think I need a picture here to this. Um, let's take a minute just to look at this picture and think about where we have gray infrastructure and where we have green infrastructure. And I gave you kind of a real rough definition of that. But take a minute to talk to your neighbor about an example of one or the other. Okay, so grant research is probably easy. We kind of think of, I said concrete, right? So let's let's spit out some examples uh, or share some examples of free infrastructure. I'll ask our friends over here in the wings. An example of great infrastructure. Anyone else can help them out? Roads, yeah. All right, so we got roads. And the road crosses the river, right? And when we cross the river, we build a bridge. And that bridge has to have go into the river, which can move, right? Water comes up, goes down, sediments moving through there. What's another example of gray infrastructure? I'll ask you all over here. Buildings. All right. So we've got Las Colonias and um, Bonsai Design, right? The amphitheater. How about um, another example of gray infrastructure that kind of interacts with the river from somewhere in the middle? Boat ramps, yeah. Sometimes they're gravel and sand, sometimes they're concrete because we need to drive trucks up and down them. Um, and we need to think about putting those in areas. Here's the boat ramp right here for Las Colonias. When you think about putting those in areas where they're going to not get washed away, right? Um, all right, so green infrastructure. This one might be a little more challenging, but who can give me an example of green infrastructure that we have in the river corridor? Something that we didn't build necessarily, but it's serving some purpose for us. Grass. Grass. What does grass do? The water. Yeah, it can. Uh, well, we have to water it, which might be a problem, but um, it ultimately just soaks water in, and so we don't get as much runoff, right? So that grass can be a nice thing to have. It's another example of green infrastructure. I heard trees. What do trees do? <laughs> they give a shade. Yeah. Yeah. They can cool things down. It's getting hotter and hotter and hotter in here. Um, so more trees can uh, provide a shade. Do we have to build an umbrella everywhere to give us shade? No, we can plant more trees, right? Just remember to water them. All right, um, one thing that we think about green infrastructure and floodplains is really just having a floodplain that is wide enough to allow floodwaters to move through without being too high and too fast and um, causing flooding issues. And so just having a floodplain can be green infrastructure. Okay, let's we'll zoom ahead. Um, often we think of river corridors and urban areas as a uh, series of strings and pearls. This is a phrase that's used in river management. So the pearls are open space areas or parks, green areas where the river can be a little more dynamic, where people can connect to the river. Uh, but we, we don't have that everywhere in urban areas because we have development. And so here's our stream. So there's the river basically not having much of a riparian area or floodplain um, through an urban section. And then it's connected to pearls, which are the, uh, you know, the nice, uh, the green spaces, as I'll say. Um, do we think that that's, this concept plays out in Grand Junction, the stream pearl concept? Yeah. How so? Well, I guess like, 
spaces, either like green spaces and then the upper river. Yeah, um, the, the, one of the kind of elements of that is the state park system that was envisioned as this kind of string and pearl type of system we have um, the island acres section up here we've got a section across from riverbend park and you have riverbend park there's corn lake there's connected lakes there's fruit out so you could think of those as pearls and there's other green spaces as well outside of the state park system so yeah absolutely we do we do have that all right now okay we've we, we're thinking about planning, we're thinking about where we want things. Well, part of that is going to be evaluating hazards. We need to think about where our floodplain areas are, where the river's moving. So let's think about um, delineating and communicating hazards. So the first thing we can do is floodplain mapping, and we'll take a few minutes to talk about what floodplains are. And there's a lot of different definitions, so we'll go through a few definitions. There's a regulatory definition, and this is played out for Las Colonias. So we have this concept of the 100 year floodplain. Have you heard of 100 year floodplain or 100 year flood? This is Bridget. Okay. Oh, great, everyone. It's fantastic. All right, so you've heard of that. <laughs> great. I don't know. Uh, another way to say that is 1% annual chance. And I prefer this way to say it because it's. I can't say that word, statistics. Um, really what, it, what this means is that every year you have a 1% chance of this flood occur. And that flood, that, that magnitude of that flood will spread out across the floodplain, we'll map that, and then that has permitting implications and regulatory implications and insurance implications for people that are um, building and living in that floodplain. The floodway is another thing that is mapped and this is really important because in, in Mesa County, you really can't develop in the flood, floodway. This is a little more restrictive. And the idea is if you were to take a, let's see here, do I have an image of that? I think I have an image later, but if you were to take a bulldozer and fill all this in and levy it up, the floodway defines how much you can squeeze in such that you only get a foot rise in the flood elevation. So it's kind of a weird definition, but um, it identifies this kind of really important zone where we don't want to allow a lot of development or any development because um, it can have impacts downstream. So if you build there, then it raises the flood for someone downstream. So engineers will map the floodplain by doing what's called hydraulic modeling. So hydraulics is really just the physics of water. And you can go out and survey a bunch of cross sections or have LIDAR, which is like a scan of topography. And you do some math with river flow data and then come up with a discharge with that 1% annual chance frequency. And then you put it in a model and it just tells you where the water will go, how deep it's gonna be, and how far it goes out. So this is the results of a hydraulic model. And ultimately that is a map that the city or county will put on their websites. This is just from the city of Grand Junction's website. And it shows you these different zones. So here's our floodway and here's the floodplain. This is the 1% annual chance floodplain. This is the 0.2% the 500 year floodplain. So we've got these different floodplains mapped and that way we can know where these flood hazards exist. So we had a huge flood in 83 and 84. I think 84 was the bigger flood. And um, I can't remember the recurrence center or the probability of that flood event, but say that was a hundred year flood in 84. All right, we haven't had a flood that big since then. What is the probability that we'll see that flood event like in the next 10 years or something like that? Something that big. Is it zero because it's not within a hundred years? No. It's that's why I say kind of every year I say it's a 1% chance and we'll talk about this um, this statistics in a little bit more detail. So what does that 100 year flood mean? It doesn't mean that it's going to happen once every 100 years. If we had 10,000 years of record on average, you would say that this flood event, this magnitude happens on average once every 100 years, but it's statistics, it's probabilistic, right? What's the probability that it rains two inches in, uh, in Grand Junction in September, in the end of September. <laughs> Pretty low, but it happened. 
Did you have a question? Yeah. What was the 2013? The 2013 flood on the Front Range. Did anyone experience that? Yeah, that was. It depended on what river you were in, and it, it gets a little complicated. But if you think about the amount of rain that fell that week in September of 2013. That had a recurrence interval of somewhere between like 200 and 1,000 years, um, or a really, really low probability of happening in a given year. The floods that resulted from that were a little bit different, though. In Boulder, it was about the 30 year flood. In um, St. Brain uh, River and Longmont, so that was about the 200 year flood. So it, the rainfall and the flood are a little bit different, but it was on the order of about a 200 year flood event. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about recurrence interval. 100 years is a recurrence interval. It's on average how much time happens between the flood, but that's over a, like a theoretically really long period. And so um, we'd expect a magnitude of this flood event to occur once every 100 years if we had a super duper long flood record, but we don't. We just have kind of our lifetimes, right? And so really, if we just divide, we take the uh, reciprocal of that, so just one over 100, we get the annual probability. Each year we have a 1% chance of this flood happening. So that's, I think a little more, it's statistics, but it tells you every year I have a small small chance of that. And what happens is every year you kind of add that up. It's not, you don't add it directly. There's a little bit more involved, but if I say, what's the probability of this happening over 10 years, it's not uh, just 1%, it's gonna be a little bit more than that. So 1% chance of occurring in a given year, that's what the 100 year flood actually means. All right, and then a little bit more because I teach stats, so I'm going to do this. Um, <laughs> say you had a huge bowl of gumballs, all right, and there's 100 of them in there, 99 are blue and one's red. That red gumball is the 100 year flood. So I'm going to close my eyes and reach in there and grab that. Am I going to get a red one or not? So I have a 1% chance of getting that red gumball. Um, if I didn't get it, then I don't have a 100 year flood. I can just chew it and not worry about it. Um, but then, so that's my year one, okay? Say I don't chew it, I put it back, um, and then I close my eyes and we pick another one up. That's the next year. Each year I have a 1% chance of it happening, assuming that the underlying probability, climate change, et cetera, isn't changing that. All right, so we, we've talked about this regulatory definition. Here's just another look at this floodway. If we filled it all in, the floodway is the, the width we could fill in so that we only get a foot of rays in the floodplain. Um, is it illegal? Is it legal to fill in the floodplain though? Can we come out here and, and do this in the floodplain in Grand Junction? Do you know? It is legal. And actually, if we go back to right here, here's our floodplain. This is the hundred year floodplain in blue. And here's the butterfly pond. Um, the this right here is the eddy line development. That's that's in the hundred year flood plan. So what do they do? They they <coughs> filled it up. They filled it up so that the structures were above that hundred year flood plan elevation. Um, so that is legal to do. I I personally don't like it, but you know. <laughs> but you, you can in Grand Junction. You can't build in the flood width. So there's a lot of different flood plains, and they all have different frequencies. So here's the um, 100 year, 20 to 100 year floodplain. This is this really broad area. And then we can kind of move down. These are frequencies or areas that flood more frequently. So um, every one to two years, we can flood this area, right? And there's certain kind of vegetation that grows there. There's a kind of riparian zone. As you go out farther, this floods maybe once every 10 years. And so we have different kinds of trees there and different kinds of management locations. So more just because you're like in or out of the 100 year floodplain, really there's a whole lot of different frequencies and variabilities of flooding that happen within that. So who regulates this? FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. FEMA is in charge of emergency response. They're also in charge of trying to keep people out of harm's way. Um, the National Flood Insurance Program is this kind of government subsidized flood insurance. If you have a home in a floodplain, you can buy flood insurance and the government subsidizes that, that premium would be really expensive because insurance companies don't want to insure homes in the floodplain. So we have federal subsidies for that. 
the, the Congress various times are, have tried to get rid of those subsidies or ratchet them down and then people freak out and they put the subsidies back. But things are changing because we're having more and more floods and more people living in harm's way. Ultimately, it falls on individual states to manage the program. And in our state, it's the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Last year, we actually had, so there's a, a gentleman named Kevin Hauck who runs the floodplain program for the state. Uh, his daughter was in this class, so we got to uh, talk about floodplains, and that was pretty cool. Um, so individual, and then ultimately individual cities and counties make their own rules. So Mesa County has its own rules for what they do in the, in the floodplain. Um, I'm gonna move on from that. All right, so we talked about then this kind of flood area, the thing that gets wet. Now let's talk about the floodplain from a dynamic river standpoint. And we'll talk about the fluvial geomorphic floodplain. This is the area that the river is moving through over the years as it migrates. And we can think of fluvial geomorphic hazards. So fluvial is river, geomorphic is the shape of the land. So morphology is shape, geo is, is the earth. And hazards come from when the river shapes the earth. Even though it does that naturally, it can, it can do that in dramatic ways that can cause problems for human infrastructure. So the fluvial hazard zone is this, this is zone. It's another kind of floodplain mapping tool. It's the area that a stream has occupied in recent history could occupy or influence as it stores and transport water, sediment, and debris. So it's moving water, it's moving sediment, it's moving wood, et cetera. And this is a little cartoon of the fluvial hazard zone. It's got these different components to it. The first one uh, is the active stream corridor, which we'll look at some examples of. And then you've got this thing called the fluvial hazard buffer, this area where the river could erode into a hillside and cause problems um, by houses falling in and that sort of thing. There's uh, some other components, but we'll just talk about these two. So with the active stream corridor, it's again, it's another definition of a floodplain. And it's the area that the river is moving through over time. Here is the St. Brain. Does anyone live anywhere from Longmont or you know, that Front Range area? St. Brain is a real beautiful little river, maybe 30 feet wide, clear kind of course bed. People trout fish in it all the time. And for decades, it kind of just hung out and did its little thing here and never really moved too much. But then in 2013, it moved quite a bit. And it completely changed its configuration. It eroded and deposited sediment and all across the floodplain. So this line here delineates this area that the river is moving within, depositing, eroding. This, these homes right here got about six feet of sediment deposited on their first floor. The fluvial hazard buffer then is this margin that the river can erode into. This is the big Thompson River that comes out of Estes Park. And it was maybe 50 feet wide or something like that in the canyon. And then it took out about 30 feet on this side. It took out the road, the highway on this side. And then these homes were essentially destroyed because they thought they were high and dry and they were, except when the river moved and, and widened and, and took out the hill slope underneath them. So the buffer then acknowledges that rivers can influence the margins of the valley. So we can put those two together and create a fluvial hazard zone map where we have an active stream corridor and a buffer. And these are areas that we can say, okay, if you build here, um, expect to be interacting with the river, all right? It's, or it's gonna interact with you and just acknowledge that. And maybe there's some things you would do to avoid that or avoid building altogether in this more hazardous zone. So we talked about floodplain maps and modeling which is where the water goes. And this is the water comes up, it can get into your home and, and get things wet and that can be problematic. And then we have the fluvial hazard zone map, the FHZ map. And that's where the river is moving, it's depositing sediment, it's eroding and taking out roads. So same kind of you know, flood hazard, but two different types of, of ways of characterizing it. So we've thought about hazards from different perspectives. Now we can think about consequences. So, um, well, we define kind of risk as what's our hazard exposure, what's the probability that a hazard will happen, and if that does happen, what's the consequence of it happening? How expensive is it, or what, what's the loss of life, potential, that sort of thing. So consequences can be threats to public safety, property and infrastructure, 
Uh, maybe there's a legal obligation to do something if something happens. And then ultimately just like, how much is it gonna cost us to keep going back and putting more riprap in and uh, rebuilding this levee and that sort of thing. So I said risk is equal to hazard probability times consequence. Um, and a, a little example of this is if we build a home in the 100 year floodplain, what's the probability of it being flooded over a 30 year mortgage? So you get a mortgage, it's gonna be about 30 years. That's the standard kind of mortgage lifespan. Um, you have to have in flood insurance if you have a, a mortgage essentially. So what's my probability? Is it 1%? So a little bit more? There's an equation and I could write it out, but I won't. But essentially it's about, it's about 25%, I think it's 26%. So you have a one in four chance of your home getting flooded over those 30 years in that floodplain. And so if we think about what's the cost of living in the floodplain, um, it's, we need to think about what's the cost of rebuilding and replacing things over time. So if I have a one, or one in four chance of getting flooded in 30 years, then each year there's kind of a fraction of that cost that I have to, to do. So we have our probability of the hazard over so many years times the capital cost or maintenance cost of doing something. We can kind of add those up over time. All right, so now we're to our, our, to all, our alternatives stage. And um, okay, we've, we've identified the hazards, we figured out where our footprint is. So we're gonna do this fruit example. We want to think about where in fruit are we going to build stuff. So, um, okay, well, I know where my hazards are. Is it new infrastructure? If it is, then um, can I minimize the impact of the footprints in these hazardous areas or sensitive areas? And if not, can I mitigate that with um, restoring something somewhere else? If it's not new infrastructure, I have the opportunity to relocate, to rehabilitate in a way that may be more compatible. And improve existing designs, or maybe it's just something old and we don't need it anymore. Is it an old levy that we don't need? Can we just um, take it out and restore the area? So these are all things that we can think about depending on what the, what the project is. We can do a lot of different things. We can do this bank armoring, which we do a lot, kind of building it stout and hopefully never doubting. But riprap does move. And then we can also kind of the other end is, is get out of the way, right? Make more room for the river. This is where in Fort Collins, a levee was removed and a floodplain was restored. So they went and planted a bunch of cottonwood trees and allowed the floodplain to be connected with the river. This is green infrastructure right here, right? This is reducing the flood peak for someone downstream. And there's, all, there's a lot of stuff in between. So we can, if we still need bank stabilization, well, we can do it in a way that provides habitat. So we can plant willows and riprap and, and make it um, have some ecosystem function as well. All right, um, I think I'm gonna just get, go jump to an example and then we'll do this little um, thought exercise together. We have until 45, is it? Okay, so we have time, okay. All right, so let's just take um, a few minutes to talk amongst ourselves about uh, an example of compatible versus incompatible. Compatible meaning working with dynamism and hazards, incompatible meaning um, and I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just not compatible uh, with, with these, these river processes that we, like we talked about. So let's, let's look at this, this interface between our rivers and Grand Junction and talk with your neighbor and come up with some ideas. Uh, and if you're taking a little rest, this could be an idea, this could be a good time to stretch and um, re-engage, all right? So take two minutes to do that, and then we'll talk about it in class. Yeah, it's like, 
Let's take one more minute and then we'll discuss. All right, friends, let's, uh, let's bring it together and, and share a little bit. So let's get someone from our back row here. Can you give me an example of, let's talk about incompatible infrastructure or compatible. We can Yeah. Yeah, I'll just kind of say like proximity, right? Proximity or uh, next to bank, right? We know the banks are going to move, even if it's like 50 feet or 10 feet, or, you know, just we know that that's an area that's going to be moving. And so if we build something right up next to it, we're probably going to have some problems. So that's just a, like a general compatibility. Yeah. Uh, for compatible, we can add some height. If you're going to build near the river, then add some height to whatever you're building. Yeah, add elevation. Yeah. Um, and I think that's just like a city policy. If you're going to build on a floodplain, you, you have to be a fill it. Or not be above. You have to be a foot above the 100 year floodplain. So, oh, okay. um, so here's our little floodplain. That's the floodplain, and then if I if I'm if my development's here, I got to build up to one foot above that and build my house. And that's at minimum. Yeah, so a minimum. The higher you go, and you want to still wasn't reasonable, but then it would be more uh, more expensive and and, and potentially expensive. yeah potentially like safer. Um, yes, it's like building a house on a cliff. You want to have. <laughs> I've got this picture of a house that someone built after the 2013 flood in Big Thompson Canyon. So just downstream of Estes Park. And the river is like coming right here and it bends around and the house is right here. And this whole area got wiped out. So they built this house and they built it like 20 feet tall on this like concrete thing. It looks like something, if you ever go to the beach and the East Coast and the, the homes are on stilts, it's kind of like that, it's pretty well. How about another, another example, Oscar quarter right here, my friends, what do you think? Compatible or incompatible? Zip line. Yeah. Yeah, the zip line. Okay. So, um, zip line. We've got a cliff or a bluff where uh, Orchard Mesa is. It is, sorry, sorry. Zip line. So, the zip line is going to come down from Orchard Mesa, it's going to cross the river. And then it's going to land over here, right? And this is like a fun thing. You can connect people with the river and have fun with the river. And hopefully it's built in a way that's like not going to be constantly fighting river movement, right? 
And it's okay if it floods, right? It's not someone living there. Yeah. Yeah. Agriculture. Right? We've got, we're growing corn or peaches or whatever. It's okay if that gets flooded once every so many years. Maybe the farmer loses some crop and that's not good for that particular year. Um, but we're not having tens of millions of dollars of damage because we had a whole subdivision there, right? Yeah, absolutely. What about like animal-based farms? Animal-based farms? Yeah, what would it look like if we had a confined feeding lot in the floodplain? Do we want that? The, in North Carolina, um, the pig farming is huge there. A lot, of, a lot of our bacon comes from North Carolina, the Eastern coast. And so the hurricanes come through there and they flood this whole area and then like millions of pigs die and the poop goes everywhere. It's, it's a nightmare. Yeah. Um, what, are <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> All right, let's get two more examples. How about from over here? Yeah. So we need dams because we need water, right? What is it? We, didn't, we don't have time to like talk about dam impacts on rivers. Dams have huge impacts on rivers. I'm gonna go say incompatible. However, we, we do have examples of, so you've got, um, you've got a little diversion dam, right? And it's gonna take water off to go into a canal. All right, so you know, we have those all over Colorado because we have irrigation. So the way to make this a little more compatible is you can actually put in a fish ladder or um, a way for fish to migrate up and get down safely. So there's ways to kind of build infrastructure in a way that can be more compatible. So yeah, that's a really, really good thought. All right, um, great. So the, I think these are some really, really good ideas. Thanks for, for sharing those. So let's look at just some other examples. Here is uh, a study that I got to work on uh, for Sand Creek. And this is a creek that comes into Denver. So Aurora, anyone from Aurora? Go Aurora. You know Sand Creek, do you go down to the park there? No, okay, that's okay. Um, it's, I think it's probably pretty easy to ignore Sand Creek. It comes through Aurora out here in the plains, it goes through Commerce City, and then downtown Denver is right here. And in Sand Creek, we have a whole lot of different uses. We've got urban uses, which really channelize, and we've got urbanizing areas, so a lot of development happening in the east, new development. So a lot of different opportunities for thinking about how we can manage this river corridor. And this study that was done, it was a fluvial hazard zone map, so kind of like a floodplain map that uh, was done for Sand Creek, I guess a help for Mile High Flood District. This is a group that manages kind of flooding and infrastructure in rivers in Denver. And it came up for some, some recommendations. So let's think about where we can avoid hazards with open space and easements. Let's think about areas where we can have energy dissipation for um, downstream of like channelized areas. Let's mitigate, mitigate risk where we already have a lot of infrastructure and urbanization. And then think about um, planning and retrofitting our infrastructure to be more compatible like we're talking about. So this study did the map, it did the hazard map, and then we came up with a plan. Um, so Katie Yacht and Michael Blazovich, some colleagues that I've worked with on this, um, they did most of the work. I just, I just got to review it. But, um, uh, but I'm going to use it because it's a really great example. So here's just some examples of that. Here's out here in the eastern, what's the county there? Rapido. That. Okay, um, so out here in the county, you can think of this as like Clifton or, um, you know, rural Fruta or something like that. And we've got developments coming in. There's a big subdivision right here. Here's the, the creek. Um, it doesn't have flow all year long, but you can see where the cottonwoods are. So that's kind of where the creek has flooded in the past. Anytime you see a cottonwood, a flood happens. So these cottonwoods, maybe, uh, let's see, the last big flood there was 65. So these cottonwoods are about 60 years old. Um, these ones are a little bit younger. All right, so <laughs> another flood. So when we, when we see this area, we're like, okay, we know this is hazardous. We know the river's gonna be moving around here and flooding here. Well, this is really beautiful. Can we conserve this? We have an open space program that can serve this, put some bike paths in there or something like that. So it's like, people can enjoy it and we don't put people in harm's way. 
All right, now where we do have development, so this is downstream, we've got a big subdivision, it's been channelized, it goes under a bridge, and there's a ton of energy here. This is going to be like really, it's like a fire hose coming through here when a flood happens. Where can we think about areas to dissipate that energy? And so we've got a, a nice park here. And what could that look like? Well, as that energy comes through, it can come through and then have the ability to spread out, drop sediment out and migrate and move around. So let's keep this open and preserved so that if we, if we put a development here, it's just gonna get kind of, it's gonna be at the, the receiving end of that fire hose essentially. Um, so that, that's just a nice area that we can dissipate the energy of channelization that comes from channelization. And then finally, we can think about infra infrastructure retrofit. So here's, uh, here's, the, here's the fluid hazard zone, a floodplain corridor. We've got a road cutting through that, a tiny little bridge. Here's that tiny little bridge. And um, this road could, could potentially be wiped out in the next big flood because these rivers move quite a bit. Is this, how important is this road? This is Jewel Avenue. Um, do we have a bunch of you know, subdivisions coming in here or not? And if it's really important, we want to make sure that this bridge doesn't get wiped out in the next flood. Well, let's think about ways to retrofit this bridge. You know, maybe it's 50 years old and ready for a retrofit. Well, we can build it wider. We can put in some flood release culverts on the side. So there's things we can do to make it more compatible. Just like if we had that diversion, there's things we can do to make that diversion more compatible with river processes. So planning for change. We need to identify hazards, do that risk analysis. Uh, that can inform a master planning process. And then ultimately what comes out of that is how do we develop in ways that are compatible with the river? And how can we have infrastructure that's compatible with the river? All right, so now it's your turn. And I want you all to get a sheet of paper out. You can work with your buddy or buddies. And we're gonna think about some river compatible developments for Fruta. This is Fruta, this is the bridge that goes across the river, Highway 340, that goes into town. And we're going to propose a development here, right? Fruta has been eyeing Grand Junction, it loves what's going on at Las Colonias and Dos Rios. Fruta wants to get a piece of that action. They want their own riverfront Move development. Hot tomato. That's it. Move hot tomato. Move hot tomato. So we've got all these gravel ponds. Is there something we can do with these gravel ponds? And we got a, a this is a historic railroad bridge here. This is where, uh, what's that company you can see that does the um, uh, outfitting here, Rim Rock. So they got a little beach there, campgrounds. Um, what can Fruta do with the north side to make it something that connects with the river? Is a nice community benefit and asset, maybe an economic benefit and asset, but it's done in a way that's compatible. We think about habitat, endangered fish habitat, we can think about migration, um, maybe getting out of the way or making room for the river and connecting with the river. So I want you to think about that and sketch this out. So we're gonna sketch. I draw. Yeah, you're gonna draw. So if you have a piece of paper, if you don't, you can kind of maybe sketch it on your computer. So I want you to think about what would, what would go where? We got, we got about 10 minutes. So footprint of things. I want you to think about what hazards are there, um, what habitat could be there, what regulations could be um, involved here. And then I'll walk around in about five minutes and, and just kind of look over your shoulders and we'll, we'll talk about it. Do a, do a rough sketch. Yeah. I'm giving you, you can draw your own river. I'm giving you a template. Downstream is this way. Yeah. This is the state park right here. Yeah, except for that one. I can't focus. Now we're 